Welcome back to episode 160 of Chess Journeys, Tales of Adult Improvement. Here on Chess Journeys, we love to look at ratings, gains, and the glory that comes with it, but we also dive into the plateaus and sometimes below that, the pits of despair. If you want to support the show, you can go to Patreon Chess Journeys. I want to thank our queen-level supporters, Tim Everett, Scott D4B6 Joe, Matt Bush, Jay Garrison, Donna Rich Burgess, Brandon Hallside, Jeff Peterson, Tobias Rex, Bob Berger, Nicholas Harrigan, Rich, Bradley Fenner, Fletcher Ray, Nathan Peterson, Christian Glaw, Andrew Rimmer, Travel Mocha, Mohammed Ibrahim, Vasanath, and King Level supporter Ian Samples. If you want to sub- appear on the show, a great way to do this is to fill out the Google form and the show notes. We do all want to hear your stories. If you want to get better at chess, a great way to do that is with Noel Studer's programs. There is a code in the show notes. It's, it saves you money. It makes me money. Everyone wins. And we have a special sponsor for this show. We have chessbook.com. This is a great tool to help you build and learn your chess openings. What makes this tool unique is its goal to minimize the number of lines that you need to learn, prioritizing only the most common moves that you will see at your level. Once you've entered or imported your repertoire into the system, it will compare it to your games on Lee Chess and chess.com to instantly show you where you've been going wrong and then train you on those lines. Um, I'm working on a new white repertoire and I put some of these lines into Chessbook. It helped me choose the most common responses by my opponent. And within a few minutes, I had a manageable version of my repertoire. What I really liked about it is once I was done putting it in, it also showed me with arrows, all my future plans and moves, and they looked right to me. Uh, so that was quite a big, quite exciting. You also can go through and see how you've been doing with your openings. That part wasn't as great for me. I, I was able to see that uh, my Carol Khan was doing slightly better, uh, but my white opening somehow, I've been playing 200 points below my ELO, so that is something I really need to work on. Uh, and some other cool features that I want to mention are model games. There's a new model game every day, but there's also model games associated with your openings if you go in and see how you're doing with them. There's pre-made openings that you can get from people like Gotham Chess, Eric Rosen, and my favorite YouTube opening source, Hanging Pawns. And what's best is that's free to try for up to the first 200 moves. Uh, so go try it. And if you fall in love with it, you can use the code SKULL20 for a 20% discount on a pro account for unlimited moves. So if you're like me and looking to get more from your openings with less study time, then chessbook.com may just be the tool for you. All right, well, let's move on to our main event today. Today, we've got Nicholas. He's an adult improver. He's a network engineer with a family. He, and he is finding a way, despite all of this, to make large rating gains lately. So we're very excited to hear how he's doing it, what he's up to. Nicholas, welcome to the show. And have you had a chance to play any chess yet today? Uh, you know, I was I was prepared for this question, but I did not play any chess today. Uh, however, I did make uh, a few moves in my correspondence games. So okay. Okay. I guess that's a little bit. Okay. Um, what is your normal chess playing regimen then? Do you play every day or are there lots of days where you just say, I don't have time today? So um, I struggle back and forth a lot with online play, to be honest. I really seem to like sitting at the board much better sitting across from somebody that seems to fit me a lot better than playing online. Um, Online play kind of fluctuates. So sometimes I get in a really good kick where uh, I'm playing a lot online, uh, rapid and blitz and some, maybe some longer time controls. And then um, the other times I'm like, man, I really don't want to play chess online at all because I don't, uh, I just don't want to. So uh, I don't think I'm different than anybody else in that aspect, really. I think everybody goes through those ebbs and flows, right? Yeah, that's fair. Do you get a lot of OTB time then? So I belong to the Waukesha Chess Club here in Wisconsin. Uh, For those that don't know where Waukesha is, it's west of Milwaukee uh, as the major city. So I'm in one of the suburbs uh, about 20 minutes from Milwaukee. So not too far, but... Uh, I do get a weekly game, so I have an over-the-board uh, weekly tournament every single week, and they usually have a tournament that runs for four weeks. So they have about 12 uh, tournaments um, a year, which is really nice. Uh, so I do get consistent over-the-board play. Okay. Yeah, I, I have the same, a, a weekly event, which 
I love because it takes away that pressure when you go to big tournaments, you know, where it's like, yeah, oh, it's my first tournament in a while. You're just playing every week. So the pressure is always kind of there. Right. I, I really believe in the consistency. I think if you've got a, a game that you're playing every single week, that's somewhat important to you that you really tried to focus on, that that can keep you kind of on the path to trying to keep improving. Uh, we all, you know, win and lose games. So there's obviously external factors that might motivate you one way or another on whether or not you want to continue playing chess because those some of those losses can be really devastating. But uh, yeah, I think it's a lot less pressure than a weekend tournament. Like you said, you go to a big event, you paid this crazy amount of money. Uh, sometimes you have to travel and get a hotel room. So there's an investment to do weekend play, you know, um, I value the weekend warriors that can do that. Uh, being a family man, I don't really have the ability to go to a lot of weekend tournaments. And I'm lucky if I get to do one or two a year. And they're usually small and it's single day tournaments. So the time controls are a little bit faster than what I would like. Gotcha. And then do you have any other clubs you go to or friends you play with over the board during the week? Uh, not during the week. I'm pretty tied up with children activities. Uh, I do work from home, so my schedule is a little bit more flexible than probably most. So right. that is a huge um, benefit. But over the board wise, uh, the only over the board that I really usually get is at the club. Okay. So there are there some weeks where you just play that one chess game for the whole week because you're like, ah, I'm sick of uh, online chess right now. I'm just going to play my weekly game and then that's it. Yes and no. So for the over the board wise, that is usually the only over the board game that I get. However, I do get my chess in a lot of other ways. Um, a majority of my time is spent studying. Mm -hmm. So I'm not getting as many reps as I'm, I probably should be. However, I do kind of supplement that with actual correspondence games and not the daily games on chess.com. I've pretty much finished all of those with the exception of a few but I, I'm playing in actual correspondence for USCF because uh -huh. I'm gaining my correspondence rating too. So uh, those are played on the ICCF server, the mm -hmm. International Correspondence Chess Federation server. So um, they are played kind of online, but you get 10 moves per 30 days. So you get tons of time, uh, but I actually a lot of times take those games and I put, if I'm struggling in one where I'm looking at it at the 2d space, I'll take it off of the there and I'll put it on the board, which I have set up behind me in my computer here. And I'll actually sit and keep it up for a couple of days and kind of stare at some positions and look at it and passing and whatnot. Hmm. That's really interesting with correspondence chess. Are you like, what is the engine or, um openings book or regular books like are there rules with that or, or there are, are. and i think there's a lot of misconceptions with oh i'm not going to play correspondence because it's all computers yeah and that couldn't that there are um servers that do that so the iccf if you play an iccf event that is computer allowed so that's just mm -hmm. a computer against another computer you're just fighting to see who has a better computer. However, I have found I've actually played in a few of those tournaments. There's a lot of people that still eh, probably more than a third that don't use a computer and you just absolutely crush them, which to me is wild <laughs> that they don't know those rules. Yeah. However, if you're playing on a correspondence uh, on that server, but it's for USCF, there are no computers allowed. However, all other printed materials are allowed. So chessable course, any book, any opening tree, mm -hmm. and then all the table bases for end games all the way up to seven pieces is also uh, claimed too. So if you have a draw and you, it's a known draw based on the table base, you can claim it. Uh, okay. And your opponent can't be like, no, I don't have table base. I want to play this out. Right. <laughs> no, it's actually, they, they actually have a downloadable version on the website for you to be able to look it up if you want to. So okay. uh, yeah, there's no contesting the uh, drawn table base uh, whatsoever. They will mark it as a draw. So I, I guess my next question for you then is like, how much do you feel like you're just relying on resources to play these games and how much is really you and getting a chance to play? This has always been that interesting dilemma for me. 
So for the correspondence games that are USCF rated, uh, I there's a fair amount. And it's usually right around out of opening book. And okay. what I usually use them for is um, before I make my move, I try to remember my opening prep, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, openings are very strong in my particular um, opinion to where I remember most of my opening lines pretty deep, uh, around 15 moves to 20 moves and most of my prep. Wow. So I can get pretty deep into a game before there is some sort of deviation, unless they play some off the wall move yeah. that's not in my prep. Uh, like anybody that starts with one B three. Okay. I'm out of, I'm out of prep. I don't really prepare for stuff like that yeah. or one B four, things like that. So, uh, it, it's, you're relying on yourself and your own gameplay and your own calculation after pretty much after the opening. Okay. That's so there, there's a fair amount. You really, what you're getting to is you're getting to a point where you're out of your prep and you actually get to play a solid middle, middle game. Okay. So you're thinking it up as a way to like be able to actually practice your actual openings rather than going online and having people play wild stuff. Cause since everyone has the opening book, are they like playing real openings? Yeah, people for the most part that I found on correspondence chess uh, are playing they're they're playing lines. So you're you're yeah. getting some sort of line in any opening that you normally play. You will get a few people that are new to correspondence chess that don't know that they can use those resources or simply don't use them and just mm -hmm. play random stuff. You'll get that, but it's quite infrequently actually. Hmm. Okay. It sounds like a lot of fun. I, I love the idea of just having a board set up in my house. That's my correspondence game. And it just always is there. And then, you know, I'm always looking at it and making moves. And it just sounds fun. What I didn't like about um, the chess.com dailies is I just, I don't know. I felt like I was just kind of making the moves in the opening book. And my opponent was. And I don't know. There was something that was unfulfilling about that. But maybe it's because it was online. And it seems more interesting to open up a book and go through it and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, th I think it depends on your perspective on that. I, I think so. I played uh, the daily games uh, when I, so I have four kids. So for a long time, I was only playing daily games on chess.com. So that's all, that's the only way I could get my chess for quite a long time, actually. And uh, I, I just used it to just keep playing for fun. I wasn't really too serious about it. But yeah, I know what you're talking about where you can kind of look at that opening book and the interesting thing is that you can see all of the percentages against yeah. what moves now you could use lee chess or any other printed you know material that's out there for those openings but i don't use those ones i use either my prepped stuff for my chessable courses or i use a book mm -hmm. that uh, i have on my openings so for me i don't get to see those percentages i have to actually calculate and think about okay what line gets me to where i want to go yeah all right that's really interesting have you found have you have you completed a bunch of these uh correspondence games yet oh yeah i've actually won a number of tournaments actually so yeah i did mention that i had won my recent tournament to you in the messages when we were corresponding back and forth but actually i've won a number of correspondence games that have uh and tournaments that have put me uh, well into the 1800s already. Okay. So I think I've won maybe three or four of them pretty quickly uh, with perfect scores, which to me was absolutely astounding. I didn't think that it was um, <laughs> going to be that easy when I started. I was expecting it to be much more difficult. So there's certainly a range of players. Okay. Maybe I'll give it a try. It sounds really interesting. Yeah, the um, tournaments are really cheap too. They're only like five dollars to join, so it's like a really it doesn't it's not a really low cost investment. For, yeah, and then uh, it actually does show up on your USCF page uh, okay. under your correspondence rating. That's cool. Um, and how long do these tournaments take to complete? It seems like it would be a very long time. So some of them can last quite a long time. Yeah, they. The ones that I've played in, uh, they were 10 moves for 30 days. That was your general time control. But I think most people that are playing online are not using that much time. Okay. So they're kind of buzzing through. And what's interesting is once you get to like move 20, 
So you get to move 10 and then you get to move 20, your time adds up so you can accumulate time. So that way, when you get to the point where you're in a really difficult middle game, you might have 50, 60 or a hundred days of time that you could really sit there and <laughs> stare at it. Now, uh, each one of those tournaments does have an end date on it. Okay. So I did not look at the rules to find out what happens if you get to the end date, but you still have time remaining. I have no idea how that works. I didn't look at that, right. unfortunately. So, uh, but every tournament I've played have fini has finished long before that. Okay. I have chess.com tournaments that I've played in for daily games that took me over 10 years to complete. Oh my god! Because they were fourteen-day tournaments. <laughs> wow! All I can say is, if my opponent accumulated a hundred days for a move and took the full hundred days, I would be getting frustrated at some point. Like, okay, are we doing this game anymore? Or are we not doing this game? That is a real. That is the kind of the interesting thing about it. So somebody could sit there for thirty days, and you kind of have to be okay with it. So there's a level of patience that you have to develop to be like, okay, what's taking them so long? Yeah. A lot of times they're probably not spending 30 days really looking at the position. They're just busy, right. I'm guessing. Yeah. But I really don't know. Yeah, exactly. Or they took one look at it and they were like, oh, I'll come back to that one later. That looks. I have done that many, many times, actually. I'm like, ooh, okay. Well, I don't really know what to do here. I'm going to have to put that on a board and take a yeah. look at it before I, I move. Time right now for this mess. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, let's go back in time a bit and talk about. The origins of your journey because it looks like you've played at different points in your life and took breaks so i'm curious like did you play it all as a kid so yeah i have kind of an interesting story that's not too different than most of the people that have been on your podcast um where yeah I, my dad taught me when i was eight and he was really the only person that i played until i was in high school mm -hmm. so for seven or eight years, I only played my dad. I played, you know, cause you learn how to, the pieces move. And then if you know anything more than that, you can beat pretty much any of your friends right away. Right. Oh, yeah. So you beat them once or twice and they're like, I don't want to do this anymore. They're so, <laughs> yep. um, I found enjoyment out of it right away. And I, my dad never let me win Ooh. ever. So he, he crushed me mercilessly. <laughs> And never, never let me win and taught me nothing <laughs> other than how the pieces move. That's amazing. He wanted to keep winning. Okay. So <laughs> I think he knew how I was and how my mind worked as a kid. And I had, he knew that I had to work it out for myself. Okay. So I didn't beat my dad until I was 16 years old, oh, wow. okay. but we played on and off and it wasn't like we were playing all the time. It was like a game a month or mm -hmm. probably even less than that. It wasn't that often. And then when I got to high school, I met a friend of mine who was into chess and we joined the chess club hmm. and I actually went to state for high school. Oh, wow. But none of this was like really all that well organized. It was organized by the players, by us. Oh, wow. So it wasn't like a school. The school was just a, a matter of a place to have the club, but mm -hmm. nobody was in charge of the club except the players. Hmm. So it was really weird type of thing. And I went to state two years in a row, my junior and senior year, and I got to play for a team event. So I got my first look at what chess was like, what like real team chess was like in high school. And I was competitive, but it wasn't like super serious. We just kind of did it for something to do for fun. Uh, we didn't place very well. Our team was not that good. So um, there's not like I have any national or state championships or anything like that. Um, but then after high school, I really didn't play chess for quite a long time. Uh, I think shortly after high school, I checked out the local club here in my town that I live in. And I think I played one or two tournament games and that was it. Um, oh, no. and you know, I was a 20 year old back then. So like it was, I had other things that were more important on my mind than chess back then. Yeah. Were these high school games like rated games or was it just totally independent? None of them were related to USCF. So it was only scholastic stuff. Um, okay. Interesting. I do remember playing one of the higher rated players that are in Wisconsin during that time period, but he was, uh, he was hosting a simul at that event. Oh, okay. So I do remember that, which was kind of cool because I had no idea what a simul was back then. And that was kind of a neat thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, I, I remember that was a really kind of an interesting thing to do back then. But yeah, none of it was USCF or none of it was rated. I had no idea what my rating was whatsoever. Mm hmm. Um, did you get to a point in high school where you could consistently beat your dad or was it just a one time, uh, how that worked? Uh, since I was 16 years old, my dad has beaten me twice. Okay. I was really hoping you were going to say he refuses to play me. No, no. He, um, actually we, that, that is the only, I, I, I actually still only have two daily games on chess.com. One of them is with him that I have all the time. So we always have one going. That's really fun. He doesn't mind losing all the time. And we do get to play over the board when he comes over to the house and on occasion. So that's nice. That's really neat. Okay, good. Good for him. Uh, sometimes those dads uh, first losses. That's the end. All right. We're going to play. Yeah, we're game. done playing. Right. Yeah. yeah. What's the game I can win at? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So you play a little bit in high school. You dip your toes into the pool of competitive chess and are what caused you to be like, eh, I'm not really wanting to do this. It's just you were busy and you thought it'd be fun and then you just didn't have the time you hoped you would? Yeah, I mean, I was in my early 20s. So once you're 21, you can drink and go party and yeah, other things are more important. I had a job. I had to make ends meet to live in an apartment, stuff like that. Right. And chess just kind of fell off. And then somewhere along the lines, I decided to come back to the chess club i was like oh well i i think i'm gonna try to go to the chess club for a little while and i think i played another two games or whatever in the mid 2000s oh. and uh, i played a little bit of time i think there was a new club championship or something coming up and i was like oh i'll join that and i played for a little bit so that was like the first time that i was actually really kind of and I wasn't super serious, but I was like, I want to play chess, mm, okay. but I wasn't serious about study or doing anything like that. I had picked up chess books and I kind of briefly read some of them, but I, I didn't really focus too much on any of them. I just kind of came and played mm. and I played a lot of blitz with some friends and stuff like that, but it was nothing super serious. It was just okay. more for enjoyment. Just having, just having fun playing some chess. Yeah. It's like, that approach back in the early 2000s got you to what, like 1150? Um, so in the, uh, my first rating looks like it was 1080. And then it kind of jumped me up to the 1200. Um, okay. But in the mid 2000s, like 2007 into 2008 or yeah, probably early 2007, I think is when I had a few tournaments. I finally finished I think I finished getting through my provisional ratings. I could be wrong. I don't remember when I finished that, but mm -hmm. I kind of had this jump where I jumped up to about 14, 1500. Yeah, yeah. It looks like you played quite a bit in 2006 for like. Yeah. There's like a couple months six. where I, I played for maybe about four to six months. Yeah. And I, I, I think I finished most of my provisional games and I kind of leveled off in the, 1500 range or whatever yeah so let's talk about that what did you do to get to 1500 do you remember i mean that's a long time so, at this point i i'd only had one resource when i was 16 my parents bought me the huge massive holger book oh the test one. chess dojo's favorite yeah yes this is a a a pillar of the chess dojo this is the only resource i had oh, wow. from the time i was 16 until i was in my early 20s and I had gone through that book uh, on my own leisure in the mid 2000s. I did every single mate in one and every single mate in two. That's all I did. Okay. That's, that was the only resource I had. And then I found, actually, I don't have it in front of me anymore. I packed it away. Um, I found the resource uh, CT Art ah, okay. because I, I bought a book called Rapid Chess Improvement by De La Maza. This yep. one. Okay. Uh, I wrote a blog about it. You guys can go look at it, of course. But I think this book was in 2004, 2002. And I think I bought it in 2004, 2005 or something like that. Okay. I was like, oh, rapid chess improvement for adult players. I'm an adult player and I want to improve quickly. This, this sounds great. Let's do it. So I read that book. And so that was my second resource. And I started using that program CT art mm, okay. or 
which is straight up tactics. That's yeah. all it is. But basically, you had one resource that was tactics, and you added another resource yes. that was more tactics. More tactics. Yes, I doubled up. Let's do a quick summary of De La Maza's book because I feel like back when I was playing in the early 2000s, everyone knew his story and the GM seemed to hate him. Yes. Um, and now it's like he's gone, but also sort of proven right. It's It's been, he's had a really interesting story. Yeah, so just to recap the book for those that don't know, uh, he came up with an improvement plan on pretty much what is considered brute force tactics. Yeah. Uh, brute force pattern recognition. So using this program, CT Art, he claimed that if you go through all of the puzzles and you do it in a fashion where, let's say you do, a, just for easy math, you do 100 a day until you go through the whole set. And then when you get through all of them, you have to time and double the output. And you do that until you get to circle seven where you do all of your the whole puzzle set in one day. So... And what he claims is, is he did this two times and he went from, he gained like five or 600 points from like a 1500 level player up to 2100 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he has some other, other, other uh, drills in here, which I find uh, are pretty interesting, like a night sight drill and things like that. So he, he talks about some other things that are in the book that are really nice, but that's really the kind of the gist of his program. He says that if you can just focus on tactics using a specific puzzle set, you go through that set seven times, going faster and faster and faster, it just builds re pattern recognition. Yeah. And he shows that he had extremely fantastic results. To me, that kind of ring true. I was like, well, I, I want to really kind of give that a go. That sounds like a great way to do yeah. it. Well, now, back I... in the early 2000s or mid 2000s, when I came back to chess, I did attempt it. Oh, okay. And it was extremely difficult. <laughs> I I couldn't do yeah. do it the way he he did it because right. that CTR program has ten thousand puzzles, mm -hmm. and he went. He says he went through all of them, and he says he did them all in one day. I've gone through this program, and I'm I waver on whether or not what he <laughs> says is true. There might be but some. What I will say is that even if you attempt it. Yeah, you will gain a lot of benefit from it. Yeah, what I think is fascinating about his work is I remember in the early 2000s, all the titled players were like, this is nonsense. You can't just get all these rating points just by doing tactics so quickly. And now when you ask titled players, what's the best way to get better? They're like, just do tactics and don't do anything else. And you're like, so <laughs> just do what you said 20 years they, ago. They, you yeah, do. They, I don't they, understand. They, they're kind of you know, going back on their word, you need to do this and this and this. Yeah. Now I had picked up other resources in the mid two thousands. I think I had picked up the amateur's mind Okay. and went through that. And I think from that point on, I was like realizing that I was, I wasn't kind of sure what type of player I was I was just like trying to get better at chess and I really had no blueprint or map on what to do I had a couple of books uh, this is obviously predates YouTube and chess videos and things like that yeah. and I didn't even realize there was an online chess community until the mid 2000s mm. you know or later 2000s and so I went back to the club I leveled off somewhere in the mid 1400s you know, yeah. after losing some games or something like that. And then I stopped playing and for quite a while. Okay. Any reason why you stopped playing? Was it like, you yeah, my, seen... my life took a drastic turn. Oh, okay. um, so I went to, I went back to college and became, uh, I went to school to become a network engineer gotcha. and then I moved out of the state and I moved around the country for a little bit. Okay. And that's a really, really long story that we don't need to get into, but um, <laughs> my life took a total different direction. Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't like disappointment with lack of progress. It was just more like that was a cool phase of my life. And then yeah. I started a new phase. It, exactly. It wasn't like it just, it, it just kind of abruptly stopped. It wasn't like I'm unhappy with chess gotcha. or anything like that. I've always been a pretty emotional chess player. I even am now today. So there could have been some emotions involved with that, but I, I don't remember there being okay. any. I do remember frustrations with not improving as quickly as I thought I should be back then, but it, it's kind of fuzzy because that's 20 years ago now. So yeah, like, sure. 
It looks like you came back between 2010 and 2011 yeah. for like one so year. What happened there? I came back home and I met my would-be wife and she has twins from a previous marriage. Hmm. So I got back into chess then because I was like, oh, my twins, I can teach my twins how to play chess. So I was like all jazzed. I can teach my kids how, how to play. Yeah. So I get to pass something down that my dad taught me. I can teach them. So I kind of got back into it for, you know, maybe three or four months to teach them. Okay. And I was able to take them to a few scholastic tournaments that also had an adult tournament with them. So that's I got them kind of interested in the chess uh, scene and what that's all about. And then neither one of them really took to chess and that kind of fell off again. Mm. Uh, my wife and I got married and then started yeah. having some kids, uh, two more kids. So I have four <laughs> oh. kids and then that's why there's a big gap from that time until now. Okay. So 2010, 2011 was inspired by wanting to teach your kids. Um, did you work on chess improvement really hard in that period? Or is that more of a, like, I'm just involved with my kids having a good time. It was more, I was involved with my kids having a good time. You know, I showed them the couple of books that I had. I had um, accumulated some other books because I was always interested in chess. I just never had a whole lot of time to kind of focus on it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was more just for fun and trying to introduce them to the game. Um, I wasn't really too concerned with my own chess progress, but I actually did end up taking them to the, I believe it was the Midwest Open, hmm, I fun. think in Chicago, which was a fairly big tournament. And now it's actually a very large tournament. Um, so, okay. and I don't believe I did re remarkably well back then. I maybe think I scored three out of five. Okay. I'm not it sure. It looks I can't like remember. the Midwest class championship. That's it. Yeah. yeah that's you gained it. rating points. You can't be unhappy with that. No, no, not at all. But I, I, you know, I wasn't there for improving. I was there just to have a couple of fun games and kind yeah. of show my kids what it's like to play tournament chess. That's cool. All right. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. My daughter and I have had a real problem trying to find bigger tournaments where we can both play because she likes more of the rapid time control. I want the classic time control and we're having a hard time. They're not usually done at the same time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Hey, right. And so then it's like, we need another person to come with us. And my wife is like, Hey, I'm not just going to sit around all day. At a chess tournament. That like, is the dude. challenge as a parent who wants to bring their kids like to chess tournaments. Like there has to be another parent there or you have to kind of be ingrained in the chess community at wherever that place is. And it's not super easy to do. So I can understand why it's hard for parents who have children that want to go to weekend tournaments that play themselves. Uh, you have to kind of pick your battles, I think. Yep. We go to her scholastic tournament sometimes. I go to my big tournaments. And then we have our Wednesday night weekly where we can both do our thing. Oh, it's great. Yeah. All right. Well, it sounds like it's time to jump ahead to the modern day then. It looks like in 2022... You come back to chess. What brings you back to chess once again? Um, my two younger kids. Oh, okay. So my two younger kids were now old enough to learn how to play. So I introduced them to chess. And now I was like, so from 2011 or so up to about 2019, almost through the pandemic, up to the pandemic or so, I also was running a gaming channel oh. that I built up on YouTube, uh, which was semi-successful. And uh, I decided uh, sometime that, that, that I would, this wasn't bringing me joy anymore. I wasn't having a good time with it. Mm -hmm. So I saw that uh, after the end of the pandemic, uh, I mean, I know we're kind of still in the pandemic, but like it's kind of tapered off and now things started opening up again. My, I saw my club opened or was about to open. So I was like, I think it's time to go back to chess because now my kids, my younger, my youngest two kids know how to play and I want to introduce them to tournament chess. Mm. So I came back in June of 2022. Okay. And did you immediately bring them with you to the first club or is it more like you're playing and then you're also playing with them sometimes? So during that summer, I did bring my son to the club for the first time. My daughter was not, she was still learning how the pieces move. So she didn't come until this summer. Oh, okay. um, 
she ended up not taking to chess. So uh, she played one tournament game and that was it. That was enough for her. That was she enough. doesn't want to play tournament chess and that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Abe, my son, he is on a break right now. He had a couple of devastating losses and oh. has not been improving and wanted to focus more on study. So okay. he's yeah. actually uh, just studying chess right now. Okay. That's fair. Uh, I can understand how devastating <laughs> devastating losses can losses be. Losses are hard. Yeah. yeah. It's the one area where I'm just so impressed with my younger daughter. She just loses and is kind of like, yeah, dad, sometimes in chess you lose. And I was like, oh, I wish I could have that attitude. You're so much, you're so much <laughs> more mature than I am. How do I know, you know, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's. So when you came back in 2022, what was your thought right, right away? Were you like, I'm jumping in hardcore or is this once again, just yeah. like when I came back, I said, all right, I'm really going to make a, a run at serious improvement. Like okay. this would be, I would categorize this as the first time I've really seriously tried to really focus and improve. And also coupled with my chess improvement, I decided to, or I decided to uh, document my journey. So I actually started a chess channel and then started posting all of my um, road to whatever I was working on at the time. So That's really cool. um, I, I went full in okay. and found um, the chess punks community online nice. and kind of started diving into everything that's out there. Cause I was like, wow, there's such an explosion of chess content. Yeah, I know how to do content creation. I can do this. I should document my journey. Nice. So I went ahead and started doing that. Okay. Um, so for the first four months, it looks like it was mostly losing rating points. Yeah. What was your thought? Yes. Were you, did you feel like, oh my goodness, people are just a lot stronger than they used to be? Did you feel rusty? Oh, like Absolutely. When I came back, I, and I knew that this was going to happen, I'm like, I'm, I, am pre I mentally prepared myself to lose 100 points. I'm okay. like getting back in form yeah. is going to take wa a while. So I'm like, I'm going to take the next six months and I'm just going to, whatever happens, happens. I don't care about the results. Mm -hmm. I know I'm going to lose because I'm way out of practice and I need to get back into practice. So at the same time, when I came back, not only did I start my channel and start getting back into serious chess preparation and playing again, I started an actual seven circle cycle. Ooh. Okay. And I said, okay, I'm going to follow this rapid chess improvement study plan and I'm going to do it. And I'm going to give it like a full, like I'm going to go give it the full college try here. You actually did it. And I, I went through and no, I did not actually do it. I failed again. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've tried that too several times. However, however, <laughs> um, I got further than I had ever had before. Okay. And instead of using the entire full set of CT art, I broke it into smaller sections because what I found was when I got to higher sections in the program, I just simply couldn't do the puzzles. They were just too challenging for me. Yeah. So what I, what happens was every time I tried this, I would get to those puzzles that were too hard. And then I would quit because it would, I can't cycle these puzzles. They're way too hard. I don't understand. So what I figured out was, oh, I'll just take a smaller chunk of the whole puzzle set mm -hmm. and I'll do that. So I think I took the puzzles that went from, I think they started 1200. I could be mistaken on that. 1200 to um, 18 or 1900. And I said, I'm going to do that puzzle set and everything above that. I don't care about that. I'll do that stuff later. That makes sense. And I had a lot more success with that. Did I complete the seven circles that time? Nope, <laughs> I did not. How far did you get? Uh, I would say probably made it to circle four or five. Whoa. So I, did, I did go through the set four times. Okay. And I found great value because in that four months where I lost the rating, I was doing that. Mm. So I gone through this puzzle set four times now. And then I had a breakout tournament, which is where you see I gain more plus all the points that I lost plus more back. I think I had a tournament where I gained 151 points in one tournament. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty remarkable. Which tournament. brought me back up to 1500. Yeah, so basically it was really diving into the seven circles, almost yes. making it through. Do you remember what knocked you off? Because you got pretty close. Um, distractions, right? 
So like, you know, I am, you know, family man. So both my wife and I work, my kids have lots of activities. I'm also a coach. I coach their soccer teams. Yep. So like, I'm, I'm extremely busy, but that was the summertime. And by the time I lost all those points, we were now in the middle of November mm. and soccer season just ended. So sometime in there, I was just too busy to really complete it and try to get through it. Yep. Okay. okay. So, but in that time, I'm not only just doing that, I started exploring all the other things that were out there. Like I found the chess dojo, I found chessable. I had no idea what chessable was when I came back. I found that out later and started finding all these other resources online. I was like, wow. And then plus all the videos that are out there, you're just like, there's, an, it's almost overwhelming the yeah. amount of chess content that's out there for people. Oh yeah. I think that's the hardest thing now is not to find content, but to figure out well, no, what am I going to spend my time on? Right. It's like, okay, I have all this, I have endless content. So what do I do? Yeah. Because there's so much, do I work on tactics? Do I work on strategy? Do I work on end games? Do I work on openings? Mm -hmm. You can answer that question in many different ways. Whichever one you pick, what resource are you going to use? Which one's the most appropriate to your level? Which one is the best? Right. And I think for everybody, it's going to be, uh, a variant of all of those things it's gonna, but it's going to be different yeah okay so you're doing your seven circles you are also working other things in trying to become a more well-rounded chess player i'm guessing uh, yeah i'm working on trying to be more universal okay. and from the time of like 2007 2008 time when i was playing till now i played primarily as like a very positional player Oh, okay. And even into well into this big jump that you see on my graph there, I was still a positional player. Actually, I can tell you that all the way up to probably almost 2024. Was this D4? Um, I, when I came back, I started with all kinds of different things. And then I found some courses by Simon Williams. He's one of my favorite commentators okay. and creators. And, um, I saw that he had an English course wow. and I was like, oh, well, I'm pretty good at positional play. I need, I guess I probably need to play positional openings. So I went hard into positional openings Okay. and I went through that for quite a long time. I'm looking through my book here, but I dabbled in all kinds of different openings because I wasn't quite sure what type of player I was. So I was yeah. focusing on my strengths. Okay. What what book is it that you're looking at right now? Um, just my uh, score book, so I can ah, see okay. what, what openings I was playing and when. Okay. And I I made some significant changes at the beginning of this year, but yeah, I was playing. I switched shortly after I came back. I switched to C four. Okay. And started playing the English, and then I was playing the French and the Dutch. Okay. As black when I came back. And I played that for probably almost a year and a half. Before and you finally like self-describing yourself as I'm a positional player. Right. This is how I play chess. Yeah. Well, I took one of those that there's that chess personality test yeah. online. I took that and I got a majority of the time that I took it, I got Lasker. So I was like, well, okay, I guess I should play like Lasker. Okay. And then there was a few times I took it, I got Bafanik. So I'm like, I guess I'm a positional player, whatever. Okay. So I kind of leaned hard into that. Interesting. And at the same time, uh, I was getting ingrained with my chess club. I um, made a new friend who you've actually had on your hmm. your chess, uh, your, your podcast here, uh, Evan Sagers. Okay. So he is, uh, he kind of, said he was able to point out in a lot of my games because he was able to take a look at them where my problems were mm, and yeah. he led me down a new path kind of and he he recommended a book to me which kind of changed my entire trajectory of how i think about chess and chess improvement oh i'm excited to hear it so he recommended me the book pump up your rating by axel smith okay so which kind of falls in tune with rapid chess improvement. They're kind of like along the same type of, Hey, if you want to improve quickly at chess, do these things type of book. Yeah. Um, 
So I read that and I read it in less than a week. And I'm not talking about just read the the words. I went through all of the games. I did every, like, it really resonated with me. I'm like, this is how you need to play and improve in chess. Yeah. So for those that don't know the book, um, he talks about the four pillars of chess. Uh, one of them being tactics or the woodpecker method, which is the um, predecessor to chess improvement, uh, rapid chess improvement. Yes, that's the yep. book. Now, I don't have the physical copy. That book actually looks massive. So it's not <laughs> I that big, it actually. On... It's kind of small. Oh, it's not too bad. So yeah. I have it on forward chess. So I have a digital copy of it. Gotcha. But what was nice about it is I could click through the games really quickly on forward chess and just kind of learn from them. Yeah. But what I got was the template for chess improvement okay. out of it, because that book shows how you should focus on the four areas of study, which are going to be um, chess analysis, you know, learning from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. And, and that also includes going over GM games, uh, the woodpecker method. So any type of tacticals, tactics type, of course, opening prep, at the most basic level, following opening principles and maybe picking up a couple opening courses and learning some lines and then practical end games, you know, <laughs> something like hundred end games, you must know type of situation. Okay. So I kind of dove all into that and started building a plan around that. And what I found was when I actually went through the first step, which was analyzing all my games, putting all my losses in a spreadsheet and I put every single law, every single blunder and every single mistake on a spreadsheet Ooh, and then i it, it, for all of my losses that i made in all of 2023 okay so i took those 12 and there was 12 of them i took i had 12 losses in 2023 i put them all in a spreadsheet and then there's a new there's a thing in the book that says how to categorize your mistakes mm. i categorized all my mistakes and it was absolutely glaring on where my issues were mm. and it was all related to tactics gotcha yeah that's tough um, one of my favorite, uh, parts of pump up your rating is he gets into really big specifics, like, uh, time issues at tournaments. And he's talking about how, like at one tournament, he, he sat still as a stone so as to not disturb his opponent who was deep in thought because they were using too much time. Yes. I wanted them to use even more time. Oh, I took that from the book and I actually yeah. used that exact thing. Yeah. I've done uh, well. this last week in my last game. I just sat there because he got up from the table. I moved my piece uh, and hit my clock, wrote my move down. Yeah. And then he came back to the table and he thought it was still my move because he didn't know that I moved <laughs> and lot. he wasted 20 minutes oh. on this move. So all I did was just sit there right? Yeah. and just right. wait. Uh, you know, and I, if some people would be like, well, why didn't you tell him that he moved? And I'm like, well, he kept getting up from the board. Am I supposed to just yeah. let him like, if you you got to pay attention. Yeah, like, I mean that's just part of the game. Part of the game. Yeah. Uh, for me like I had an opponent who was you know working hard um and I had got up to go get water and I came back and I was like this person is really spinning their wheels and I know the psychology is when your opponent sits down it's kind of that alert of like oh they're back. Wow. Oh I yeah, stay away move. until they move. Yeah, so yeah. I I often will find myself doing that where it's just like well, I guess I'm gonna wander for longer than i had anticipated so it's uh it's, it's an interesting it's interesting to get into that those parts of chess it's not just making moves at the board right there's all the psychology involved with chess yeah especially over the board there's all kinds of other factors that you don't really ever consider until you're sitting at a chess board yeah for sure okay so you decide you're gonna build a program about around pump up your rating so let's start with number one you analyzed your games you put yeah. them all into a database. You figured out by yourself what your mistakes were. Okay. What was number two again? So yeah. once I found that, I found that all of my issues were related to calculation mm -hmm. and tactics. Okay. All but two of my games had issues with tactics and calculation. So I said, well, that's obviously my most glaring issue. I need to, I need to plug that hole. Yeah. So how do I do that? Well, I go back to rapid chess improvement. All right, here we go. I am going to solve this problem. Mm. 
And what I did was at the beginning of the year, I started on a new set, <laughs> still using CT art, okay. but my more condensed version. And I said, well, I'm not going to do it the way he's going to do it. I'm going to do it my way. Okay. And I made an, I, cause I was, I put myself on a path. I'm like, I have an accelerated timetable. So I need to accelerate Whoa. this rapid chest improvement because what happens is I think for me, in my mind, I got bored really fast. If I'm only doing 20 tactics a day, yeah. I'm, it's not enough to right. me. Yeah. So I said, I'm going to start with 80 a day. Hmm. And I'm going to do 80 or 80 or 60. I can't remember what it was. And I'm going to do that 80 or 60 a day. And I'm going to go through the whole set. And I'm going to do that three times for the first three circles. And okay. then I will jump up to 120 a day or then double it and half it. Okay. And I started that at the beginning of the year and I finished it in April. Hmm. And I actually finished it. I did it. Wow. I completed one. Yeah. And, and I completed it at the end with over 95% accuracy. So it brute forced all of those positions and combinations into my head. Okay. I saw, oh, wow, there's got to be something to this. So I'm going to do it again. Whoa. <clears throat> and I'm going to choose it with a different thing. So I picked up a uh, tactics course called Tactics Time One, mm -hmm. which is, I think, 10 or 15 bucks on Chessable. And that has a thousand and one positions. I said, I'm going to do it again. And I'm going to do it with this new course. Yeah. I did it again with that course. And I finished that just a few, maybe a month ago. Oh, wow. Okay. A few weeks ago. And I finished that. And I finished that with over 95% accuracy. Okay. Actually, no. Out of 1,000, I think I made 21, 25 Jeez. incorrect moves. That was it. So 25 out of 1,000, I was not able to get on the final circle. Okay. And then are you do these are you're doing on chessable? I'm doing on chessable. So when I get to the end of the course, I reset it and start again. Okay. So you're not going the chessable timeline. You're you're using No, I, I said I don't care what the chessable timeline is. I'm just gonna reset the course and do it on my own timeline. So essentially what I was doing was I went through the course three times. Uh I think it took me a week. Hmm. A week and a half maybe two weeks to do one circle. So in six weeks, I went through the course three times and okay. then I doubled it in half the time Okay. until I did all 1,001 in one day. What was that day like? That was brutal, man. <laughs> it was so <laughs> brutal. Uh, it's, it's rough. Um, but at that point, it, things are becoming automatic. It's not, you don't have to sit there and calculate. You almost, you just know it. Yeah. So if you're really following this program, you'll find that in the first few circles, one, two, three, and four, you're learning and you're still calculating. But once you get to five, six, and seven, things start becoming automatic. Okay. And so then <clears throat> do you feel like, okay, there's just a thousand patterns. I've got them. They're in my head. If I if it ever pops yep. up my game, boom, it's just my brain knows it. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly what it feels like. And, and it's amazing at how much of that stuff you actually end up seeing in your games. Mm. And then you might not see those exact patterns, but what you'll find is, is when you're doing all those two and three, four move combinations, you will see other two and three, four move combinations in your games that won't be the same, but you'll be able to calculate them because you're like, oh, I've noticed a few things in my game since... I've done this twice now where <clears throat> my calculation seems a lot more crisp and clean than it did before. Wow. I've always been tempted to try it and I've never gotten very deep. And so you're tempting me once more. Well, I mean, if you look at my rating graph, uh, it kind of shows that it works. Yeah. So do, you, do you feel like, is that what you attribute most of your recent success to? Cause you went from, 1643 yeah. to 1849 in like three months here. Yeah. So in the course of a year and a half, almost two, well, almost to the day, two years, I went from 1344 to 1849. That's more than a 500 point jump. Yeah. Okay. And I attribute it all to, well, not all of it, but 70 to 75% of it is because I'm cycling that many tactics that much. Yeah. It is extremely helpful. Now, coupled with, 
The other thing that I do that is extremely helpful is every single one of those mistakes that I put in that spreadsheet, mm -hmm. I then put into my own custom chessable course. Okay. And I work on all of those under spaced repetition. So I'm not making those same mistakes ever again. Okay. Gotcha. So you've got, that's also text. And then it says uh, in the book, you were saying openings and end games. Have you followed that wisdom as well? Or are you just like the tactics is pretty much all I need at my level? A uh, majority of my time goes to tactics and calculation work. Okay. Um, I do have another, I'm using the forcing chess moves. Hmm um chessable course for my calculation okay because those are pretty challenging yeah uh, i've dabbled in the uh woodpecker method okay so that is on my list of going through but i'm not going to do it under the woodpecker method i'm going to do it under the seven circles way yeah when i They're get to hard. that because after you get through the intermediates it gets really really hard so yeah that's what i found um, i have worked on it but hmm. i think that the key to my success or my rating jump is a few things. One, um, I found the, I found a path that works for me. I'm not sure if it will work for everybody else, but I know what worked for me as an older adult. And what I found was as an older adult, we just don't have the patterns in our head and we need to cram them in somehow to learn them. And it doesn't, they don't have to be difficult patterns. They just have to be a lot of patterns because right. tactics time, any 1500, I mean, even a 14 or 1300 player could go through that whole course and figure them all out with enough time. Mm -hmm. But if you're cycling them and you're cramming them in quickly, I think it's extremely beneficial for your pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. And then consistency is huge. Like yeah. you have to be working on this stuff all the time. If you're not, if you're like, I'm going to work on tactics today and then not work on it for two or three weeks, mm -hmm. there's no benefit there. Why even work on the tactics in the first place? Okay. Yeah. So you're a big fan of consistency and a big fan of tactics. What if somebody's a really low level chess player? Do you still say like, we'll just choose an easier set of puzzles and cycle those? Or do you feel like, you know, just playing is what a lower level player needs. So I think both are very beneficial. It depends on what type of person you are. Do you enjoy playing? If you enjoy playing a lot, go play, just play and play and play. If you enjoy studying at the, the studying aspect of chess, then yeah, picking up a, a course that has, you know, something for beginners is really great. Um, I'm this polar, this polar book is, is really, it's huge because yeah, it's only mating patterns, right? But what it teaches you is two and three move combinations. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't just apply to checkmate patterns. It, it also applies to middle game stuff where yeah. I can remember vividly the first couple of times after I went through that book, I saw patterns that I'd never seen before, but I understood mm -hmm. them and I could calculate them because I understood okay, if I take this piece here, it's going to undefend this piece. It was like a distraction type of tactic. Yeah. But it, I didn't learn that from anything other than a mating pattern. So that Polgar book is huge yeah. um, for people that are, you know, 500 or new to chess or 500 to a thousand. I think if anybody just goes through that book one or two times, it, you'll, you'll get up to 13, 1400 really easily. Yeah, I've been, I just started going through it myself the mate and twos. I hadn't done those before. And uh, very quickly uh, you just develop really important skills of like the walls that pieces make, right? Like this knight with this Bishop means it's cutting off all these squares and it. And I think just the more you see it, then the more you can apply that to other middle game positions where it's like, Oh, right. That piece won't be able to move because of this little wall right. that's being made. Yeah. You learn how one or two pieces work together. Yeah. And what square, like you said, what squares they cover and what squares they don't when they're together in conjunction, right? Gotcha. Um, what do you feel like is is your trajectory here? Are you planning to do a couple more seven circles over the next two years, gain another five hundred points, and be twenty four hundred? What What are you uh, <laughs> looking like? Your Your What are you hoping your plan? So I am in the middle of a new seven circles okay. using sure. a new tactic set uh, called improve your chess tactics, which is a little bit more challenging that I found. 
and I'm struggling with the later ones because they're, they do get kind of hard, okay. which is okay. I think I need that kind of challenge, but yeah, I'm going to keep doing the same thing and I'm going to keep doing it until it stops not working. Um, I've gotten a lot of, uh, interesting comments on Twitter about my improvement hmm. from, you know, people in the community. And I, I mean, I've proven that it works. Yeah. Uh, so I, I know that if anybody really wants to improve, they just have to sit down and put the work in. Mm -hmm. And if you follow these things, I, I believe it can work for anyone. Um, I also believe that anybody can reach master. So that's my top end goal right now is reaching master. But I don't, I, I set the goal and I don't really think about it. Uh, so the only goal that I set that I, that I kind of come back to every once in a while is I just try to go up the next rating band. So when I started, I was 1344 while well, I was 1450 or whatever. And then I dropped over hundred points. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, I want to get back to 14, 1500. Mm -hmm. After that, I said, I want to get to class B after that. I said, I want to get to class a, and my last tournament, I just gained 130 some points and put me well into class a. Nope. So now I'm kind of at the point where, okay, I'm, 150 points from expert. So that seems doable. Sure. And if I keep doing the things that I'm doing, analyzing my games, adding those mistakes to my chessable course and keep doing and working on tactical problems along with working on my end games. I, I don't know where I'll top out. I, I really don't know. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So it sounds like I do also top have the out, thought top out. what's that? You'll top out wherever you'll top out. That's right. Yeah, exactly. About. So I, I do have the idea in my head, like, is this kind of imposter syndrome? Do I <laughs> am it like, cause yeah. you, you hear, and you hear enough of people saying you can't do it that way. Yep. And then, you know, and I'm not the one to believe any, what anybody says. I'm on the other side of that coin. When somebody tells me I can't do something, I'm the, oh yeah, watch me type of guy. So there it's incredibly motivating to be on Twitter and having people say that you can't do something. Mm. So that's a huge bonus for me when somebody tells me that <laughs> so you, you welcome the haters. I do. I do. Yeah. Um, but what I also did at the beginning of the year is I dropped my entire opening repertoire. Oh, okay. Gone. I got rid of all positional openings whatsoever. Yeah. So, and there was a catalyst for that. I heard two of the people that were on your podcast um, kind of had, it had me thinking differently about how I need to think about openings and how I need to think about my own personal development. So being a primarily positional player, I said, oh, my weakness is open games. Mm -hmm. And I guess what's been holding me back from really improving has been playing positional openings where I'm not seeing the tactics that I'm studying and working on. Yeah. That's what I've been wondering. So I, there was one um, episode with Stasia Pew that you had on. Oh yeah. And she <laughs> talked about how her, her coaches who are international IMs and their names uh, escape me, but Calvin block was one of them. Maybe that sounds right. Yeah. Said that, she didn't have any fundamentals. She didn't understand the, yeah. you know, all the tactics on F7. And I was like, I related to that extremely well. And I said, okay, I am going to completely drop my repertoire and I'm going to play a more aggressive attacking style. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in over 20 years, I switched over to E4. Okay. Which feels like it makes sense. Like if you're going to spend all this time on yes. tactics... Let's that was the missing thing that uses it. I think that was the missing piece to really get improvement. Yeah. So you kind of see that I, I kind of halted up for a, a brief few months where I was like mm -hmm. around the 1650 range where I lost some points and I was kind of just sitting there like waiting to pop through. Yeah. And it, I, that was the catalyst that said, okay, it's time to make a change. And it, it's made a huge difference. Yeah, that's really cool also, because I think a lot of people, when they make that big change, they lose about 200 rating points. They get them back as they become familiar right. with the repertoire. But especially E4, which is so broad, your opponent it can is, play anything they want. It's really It was daunting to be like, oh no, 
like, cause I was really comfortable. I'm like, I can play C4 mm -hmm. and I can go in and I know all the lines in the Botvinnik English and I can force you to do what I want you to do. Yeah. Uh, you're going to go, you're going to play the way I want you to play. Mm -hmm. Instead, it, it's really daunting to go from that and be like comfortable and be like, okay, I'm going to play E4 and have no idea what, what I'm doing yeah. whatsoever. Terrifying to me. It is, it's absolutely terrifying. It is a hard pill to swallow. But after hearing that episode with, with Stasi, I was like, all right, I'm going to do it. Cause nice. like, I'm just going to commit to it. Mm -hmm. And will I have a bad game? Will I, you know, will I make mistakes? Absolutely. That's going to happen. That's how you learn in chess. Yeah. But for me, it, it was a huge, huge improvement to be able to do that. Cause now I've went back and took that test again. Mm -hmm. And I don't get Botvinnik and I don't get uh, Lasker anymore. I got Fisher, ooh. which to me was crazy. I was like, wow. Like, yeah. So for anybody listening, I would say if you're, if you feel like you're stuck and you have been playing whatever openings for so long, drastically change them to something opposite of what you think you should be playing. Yeah. And then go from there. So if you're like, you know, a very tactical player and you're like, I'm not improving, I'm stale, go switch to C4 and then really try to play positional chess. I really think it helps to have a well-rounded background. My tactics were so far behind my positional understanding mm -hmm. that I could never progress because I was stuck. Yeah. Like, so now I think my, my tactics are finally reaching a point where they, they meet where my uh my positional understanding is so i think that's why i've been rising so quickly yeah that makes sense um i think my last question for you is this <clears throat> uh isn't it boring to do the same set over and over and what do you do when it's like oh it's been four months of the same grinding seven circles i can't do it anymore what keeps you going or do you just love it so no, I actually hate it. Um, I I believe that in order to improve, there has to be pain, yeah. some sort of pain or discomfort. You know, the I'm from the generation similar to you, the no pain, no gain generation type of situation. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that as a statement. However, I do believe for anybody to improve, there has to be some sort of discomfort on something that you don't like doing. I actually really do not like doing tactics. It's not boring to me, but I, I really dislike it. Like every day I'm like, oh, I got to do my tactics. I got to do my tactics. I have to. And I force myself to do it. And every time I do that, I get this like little win. Mm. And I think every one of those little wins where you're, you're fighting against your mind, it, it, it is helpful. But so the fact that I've done the seven circles so many, I've attempted it so many times and failed, but I've actually been successful a few times is I, I learned and curated it to how I need it to work. And it's not four months for me. My whole seven circle cycle is two months. Mm, okay. So I get through that, that thousand problems in two months. And I think if you can find out the best way that works for you, even if you need to drop it down to a smaller set, like 500 or 400 or whatever, then do that. Hmm. But for me, uh, no, it doesn't get boring. Um, it's, there's some mundane times where it's more like, oh, I really just don't want to do tactics today. Yeah. It's more like that than mm -hmm. looking at the same problems. Because I mean, think about it. Can you, bring up a thousand problems in your mind right now, all of a sudden, like off the cuff. No. And like no. <laughs> you see them and you're like, Oh yeah, I remember this. Oh yeah. I remember this. So every time you see one and you recognize it, you're like, you get a small win. And yeah. for me, that gets exciting, especially um, when you get to the end of the cycles where it just yeah, becomes really bad or something. Are you charting the amount that you get correct or does chessable do that for you? I just go by what comes up with how many difficult moves I have at the end. Okay. So chessable does it for you. Now I'm not tracking it based 
uh, I'm kind of roughly tracking it. I'm not really tracking it completely. I just know based on my last score because I left my last tactics time one chessable course up yeah. and it said I only had like 25 difficult moves or something like that, which is like less than 2% of, yeah. or something like that, or 0.2%. I don't even remember what it was, but it's a very small amount. Two months sounds almost doable. And it's also perfect for a summer break. So maybe at the next summer break, I'll uh, I'll try to take it on. So yeah, if you, if you decide to do it, work backwards. Mm, okay. So what I mean when you schedule it, work backwards and make your thousand because circles five, six, and seven become very difficult. You have to schedule that week to be on a week. You have nothing going and make sure those last three days, you really have nothing going because you're doing 500, 500, 1000. Yeah. How long does that take? Is that like an eight hour day? Um, I think when I did my last one, it took me about six hours six or seven hours. And I, I took two or three breaks in there where I, I went and had lunch and then I came back and plowed through another hundred or 200. And then, yeah. So you, you have to kind of break it up. It, okay. I didn't go straight through one from one to 1,001. <laughs> yeah. Did you schedule um, any breaks in there or were there no days off? Uh, yeah. So I didn't schedule any in between circle one and four. So I just, I went through 80 a day for six weeks. Okay. And then circle five, six, and seven, I took a, a like a day or two off on each one Okay. before I started that circle again. Okay. And it was mainly um, because I had things going on and I, I wanted to shift it and I didn't want to be distracted when I was doing it. So yes. that makes sense. Okay. Well, this sounds fascinating. Um, we have yet another example of someone who has taken on the woodpecker method, the seven circles, whatever you want to call it, and found, sounds like amazing success with it. So um, yeah, for everyone out there, here's another, here's another example. That's all you need. All you need to do is two months of tactics and you'll be great. <laughs> I think it's a little bit more than that. I, it's not the only thing I was doing, but yeah, I mean, if you have the time, you should be it's it's extremely beneficial yeah sounds like it well nick uh thanks so much for coming on if people want to get a hold of you and follow up with your progress your what you're up to where can they get a hold of you so i'm on all the major social medias just look up high ground chess um if you google it all of my things come up uh i'm on twitter i'm on youtube i'm on tiktok i'm on twitch i have all of them so uh, if you find high ground chess, you'll be able to find me. So and is I'm the... most active in my discord. Uh, okay. As you know, I was not super uh, quick to respond <laughs> on Twitter. So okay. I will eventually see your message. If you reach out to me on Twitter, it just might take a while. Okay, fair enough. Um, and is your high ground tag from Star Wars or is that from something else? Uh, no, I just came up with okay. it. I uh, Yeah, actually, me and another friend were talking. Yeah, I... I actually forgot about how it came about and you just kind of reminded me of it. There was a meme or something about that came through about the high ground with the, you know, the Anakin and Obi-Wan yeah. Kenobi. And I'm a huge Obi-Wan Kenobi fan. Okay. And yeah. It, it does stem from that. Okay. So, Don't yeah. do it, Anakin. I have, the high <laughs> I have the high ground. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if you are doing all your tactics, you should have the high ground. You should start melting all these players okay. with your lightsaber. There you go. Um, and I believe when you finish the seventh circle, you get your lightsaber. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah I've got exciting. two of them well, now. So they send it to you in the mail and everything. Yeah. Ax Axel sends it to you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And, uh, for the listeners out there, I hope this is the tournament where you gain, you know, 130 points in one tournament and go undefeated. If it's not, that's okay. Just do some seven circles and come back next week. We'll have another guest with some more advice for you. So have a good one, everybody. Goodbye.